Wie ich ja schon erwähnt habe, arbeitet Terra Andrews aktuell an einem Projekt mit dem Namen Releven. In diesem Projekt geht es um das Verständnis von mittelalterlicher Geschichte. Konkret das 11. Jahrhundert. Durch den Einsatz digitaler Daten und Methoden hat das Projekt gezeigt, dass unsere bisherigen Vorstellungen vom 11. Jahrhundert nur bedingt stimmen. Im folgenden Video thematisiert Terra Andrews, wie digitale Ressourcen und Technologien zur Erforschung der mittelalterlichen Geschichte eingesetzt werden können und mit welchen Herausforderungen diese digitale historische Forschung einhergeht. So sind in der Geschichtswissenschaft Fakten oft uneindeutig und umstritten. Das macht die Strukturierung und Zuweisung dieser Daten auch potenziell unverlässlich. Wie soll mit diesen teils widersprüchlichen Informationen umgegangen werden? Einen Ansatz dafür stellt das STAR-Modell zur Verfügung. Dieses Modell erklärt Tara Andrews Ihnen am besten selbst. The 11th century. What do you know about it? I'll give you a hint. The first crusade happened right near its end in 1095. If you're like most people in the Western world, you'll have been taught that the 11th century was deep Middle Ages. That's a time of limited travel and even more limited knowledge about others. You hear scholars say things like, even nobles could expect to live their entire lives without traveling more than 100 kilometers from home. That's why it might surprise you to hear another scholar of the same period talking about the quickening of long distance trading and written communications, or ever more frequent face-to-face -face encounters of Western Christians with Easterners and also Muslims and also in Scandinavia and Rus with pagans. The question I want to explore in this video is, how can we put together viewpoints of the past that seem to come from such completely alternate universes? And what does that have to do with digital humanities? You might have already guessed the answer to the second question by now. In this day and age, we can collect a huge amount of data about the past, and the 11th century is no exception. But we have to be careful about how we use the data to make sure we don't end up fooling ourselves about the history we're trying to study. Let's look first at the problems we have on our hands with all this data, and then I'll discuss the approach we are taking to try to solve this in the Releven project. So the thing about medieval history is it wasn't just one place. We have to think about the history of France and the Holy Roman Empire, sure, but there were also things happening in Spain, in Hungary, in Kiev, in Constantinople, in Armenia, in Syria, in Egypt. That's a lot of data in a lot of different languages talking about a lot of different things. If we want to get any sort of coherent overview, even of, say, the Christian world, we need a way to integrate all of these different regional pictures. And when we're talking about vast volumes of small pieces of information that don't obviously hang together, computers and digital data would seem to be a very obvious means of approach. In fact, there are quite a few digital resources and an ever-expanding amount of information that can be accessed online. Aside from non-academic resources like Wikipedia, there are academic resources, directories of medieval people called prosopographies. There are directories of ancient and medieval places called gazetteers. There are all sorts of collections of texts and documents online that give us information about the past. And yet these resources don't really connect with each other. Why not, you might ask? Isn't the point of putting information online that it can all be linked together in one great big happy semantic web? Indeed, there has been a lot of work on standard vocabularies and technical specifications and logic formalizations, these are called ontologies, to help push this forward. But a closer look at how these resources are used or not used suggests that the problem is not just a technical one, but something more fundamental. The semantic web, all of those vocabularies and ontologies and so on, it was conceived in the modern day for cases where we know the facts and we don't doubt the facts. This assumption breaks down massively when we try to record things about history, where we are often unsure about things and might not even agree about what we can be sure of. Currently, there are two approaches to making a data set of historical information. The first is to use these ontologies, these formal definitions of reality, to create a bunch of linked open data. With an ontology, you can name concepts that have to do with a particular domain. For example, we could define a human-kin relations ontology with concepts such as mother or brother or spouse. And then we can specify some logic to make inferences, such as if this person is a mother, then they must have had at least one child. Or indeed, if this person is the mother of these two children, then those children must be siblings of each other. This is a way of making sure there's logic in the data we have. 
Then when you create the data, you can link it together and even link your data with someone else's data as long as your ontologies are compatible, as long as you're speaking a similar language. But of course, in order to use these ontologies to make inferences about history, we have to be pretty sure we have the right rules and we have to be pretty sure we have the right information. One of the limitations of an ontology is that it's meant to represent a single reality. So if you use it in a straightforward way to define rules about how families were composed, and then try to accommodate two medieval histories where one says these guys were brothers, and another says that one of these guys only had sisters, your system will break down pretty quickly. A second approach is to use a concept called factoids. This is quite popular for prosopography collections, these big databases of people. The idea of a factoid is that it isn't exactly a fact, it isn't necessarily true, but it is some bit of information that comes from a historical source. The source might be a history written in 1073, or it might be an inscription on a building or on a coin. All of these factoids are collected together under the heading of the person they are about, and there isn't any attempt to say what is true or not. The important thing is that someone at the time claimed it. These databases can then be used as a sort of index to every time a particular person was mentioned somehow, and it's up to the user to decide what they believe. Ideally, reality would match what the sources tell us in all cases, but we know from experience that this is naively optimistic in most cases, and especially in the medieval period. So then what if we want the best of both worlds? What if we want to be able to rely on the logical expressions that linked open data and ontologies give us, but also keep track of when our sources disagree? What if we want to try to understand what actually happened, when reasonable people even today can disagree. One thing we have to be able to account for is uncertainty. We can record that we are more or less sure of particular bits of information, but what we often want to represent is conflicting certainty. Historians can be pretty convinced that they are right, even when other historians are pretty convinced that they are wrong. So the question becomes, how can we capture in data a bunch of alternative viewpoints about history and check them for internal consistency but not have to decide which one is true? This was the motivation for the assertion model, which is at the heart of the work my team is doing on a new method of historical data collection. We call this the STAR model for Structured Assertion Record. Here we are trying to approach the problem that on the one hand, we already have a lot of collections of linked open data. On the other hand, nearly all of these collections were designed without controversy in mind for the most part, meaning that whatever was put into data was assumed to be obviously true. And as a result, these bits of information tend to get cut off very quickly from any clues about where the information came from or who believes it, because those source clues aren't seen to be so important if we know the data is true. The STAR model is a way of restoring some accountability into our data, in this case less to keep ourselves honest about our own logical processes, and more to keep ourselves honest about where this data is coming from and what the rest of the implications are if we choose to believe any one particular statement. The basic idea of linked open data is that you have a subject, who or what did the thing, a predicate, what they did, and an object, who or what got the thing done to it. This is called a triple. And then the same subject and object can be used in other triples, so that they become linked together in a big chain or web of data. But we notice already that we can't link whole statements together. That means we can't say anything like, who claims this is true, or where did we read this claim? In the STAR model, we make that predicate into a thing, so that we can attach all three pieces of the statement to an assertion, and then attach information about the authority, who said it, and the source, on what evidence, to the whole statement. It also means that we can use the same subject and predicate or the same predicate and object in a different assertion because someone else found some evidence that disagrees. The second assertion would then have a different source and quite probably a different authority. With this information, the user still has to decide who to believe, but isn't making the choice quite so blindly. They could, for example, look at all the assertions by one authority and try to decide if that authority is contradicting itself. Eventually, with this approach, we can define viewpoints that are held by different people. Your viewpoint is the collection of all the assertions you believe to be true. And then we can look at the data from a bunch of different viewpoints. Where did the Byzantine emperor think his borders were in 1085? Where did the chronicler from the city of Edessa think the borders were? When did people in Antioch stop thinking of it as a Christian city? 
How about people outside Antioch? This kind of approach will let us get a much more useful perspective of our own on the processes of contradiction and conflict and change that defined the world of the 11th century and help us account for how our various cultures of the present drew sometimes such different lessons out of the events of the past.